Welcome, welcome, welcome. If you'd like to take your seat, whoever isn't taking a seat, that would be lovely. Um, welcome to our second session on courage and climate. My name is Martin Wright. I'm a fellow of the RSA. Uh, I'm also director of Positive News, the media cooperative that's focused on good journalism about good stuff. Um, and you might be forgiven for thinking there's not so much good stuff going on when it comes to the, the climate and the nature crisis, the evidence of the seriousness of which is becoming more and more apparent every day. And um, indeed, if you hope that that evidence of the threat to, I don't know, the little matter of all that we love and hold dear would trigger this back up the agenda, um, you might be forgiven for thinking over the last year or two that this is sadly far from the case. Um, we've seen the climate crisis being eclipsed by war in Ukraine and Israel, Palestine. And we've also seen something of a backlash. The phrase people use is a green lash, which it can at times almost seem like there's a concerted campaign to play down the threat of climate change and play up the costs and the risks of tackling it. So we've seen, we've seen strident claims that net zero will bankrupt Britain and hammer the pockets of the poorest. We've seen farmers on the march across Europe denying, decrying climate regulations and campaigning against initiatives like rewilding. And we've seen climate skeptic parties gaining ground also all across Europe, and of course the looming prospect of that arch climate denier winning a second term in Washington. All of which could lead you feeling a little bit downhearted about the prospects of tackling the climate crisis. Um, in which case, be not downhearted because here we have an antidote in these two people. Um, they've got the courage to meet the climate and nature crisis head on and inspire others to ignore the skeptics and embrace a more hopeful vision of the future. Um, that's appropriate because as you've been hearing today, courage is very much the theme of the RSA in 2024. And these guys, I think, epitomize courage in action. Um, to introduce them on my left, Professor Lorraine Whitmarsh, MBE. Lorraine is an environmental psychologist, hugely experienced researcher, academic, looking at how we can live well, well as individuals and society, making the changes that we need to make to confront the climate crisis. She's the director of CAST, the Centre for Climate Change and Social Transformations. And I suppose one person who epitomises those kind of transformations is the guy here on my right, Kabir Kaul, who's also a fellow of the RSA. Uh, London born and bred, he's a wildlife writer and campaigner, he's a member of the Mayor of London's Rewilding Task Force and the RSPB's Youth Council. Uh, you might have seen him on TV, he's reported on Springwatch. Um, he started a blog which has got the most fantastically punning title of Call of the Wild when he was 13. And I think it's fair to say you packed more into your teenage years than most of us would do in several lifetimes. Um, Kabir is also a living reproof to the rather lazy trope that environmentalism is only the concern of the posh and the white and the privileged. Um, that is so not the case in your case, Kabir. But um, let's just start off with you. What, what first sparked your interest in this stuff? Well, Martin, I've always been interested in nature somehow. It sort of arose organically. There wasn't one person, one family member or friend that directly influenced me. I think the earliest memory I can have of being interested in nature was as a four or five year old looking at David Attenborough when Planet Earth had just been released and seeing all these amazing animals, these giraffes and flamingos and moles and crocodiles and thinking this is incredible that all these species, I can see them here, all these wonderful animals. Um, and uh, then I became quite nerdy. I started looking at animal encyclopedias and trying to memorize the taxonomic order of all the animals. Um, and that's what I did for many years. And then I, and I really enjoyed seeing this huge diversity of wildlife. Um, and then eventually I looked outside on 
one day when I was seven or eight and looked into the garden and thought, all these animals I've been reading about, I've been watching on um, David Attenborough's documentaries, are any of them in my local area? Can I go out and watch wildlife locally? And sure, surely enough, I did see lots of wildlife, mainly birds, so I became a birder. And I went to all these different local parks and gardens and nature reserves and found the most incredible wildlife, including one wildlife site, uh, White Rice Lido in northwest London, uh, which has a couple of hundred migratory ducks that come from the Arctic every winter. Um, and I thought, this is incredible. People need to know about it. It's in an urban area. And that's how I became a, a campaigner for urban wildlife. So it was a, a rather organic journey, but it started um, from when I was uh, very young. And you've been involved in all sorts of other things. I mentioned a couple of them. You've also been involved in uh, drawing up the Nature Reserves of London map and campaigning for London to be a national park city, for London to be actually an urban national, national park. You've also, uh, you were telling me just before we, we came on, you've scored a real victory in Ealing, of all places. And I say Ealing, of all places, because it's about rewilding Ealing. Tell me a little bit about that. Yes, so in Ealing there's a meadow called Warren Farm and we received some unexpected news the other day. I'll get on to that very soon. But Warren Farm is a 61 acre acid grassland habitat and acid grassland is very rare in London and with that acid grassland habitat there, come, there will live a lot of rare species, lots of rare plants, insects and skylarks and over a quarter of London skylarks live in Warren Farm. Now the council wanted to build sports pitches on the land um, and they had set out in another strategy that there were actually better places, more suitable places to redevelop for sport other than Warren Farm. So we proposed to them that there's a field adjacent to Warren Farm which uh, is not as ecologically um, valuable as, as, um, as Warren Farm and we, we wanted them to build there instead and uh, I can say that it was very unexpected but we received um, news from the council that they'd finally agreed to um, uh, build on the land adjacent to Warren Farm and designate all of Warren Farm as a protected local nature reserve for the Skylarks. And that is something that we had been campaigning for for years so that this site could be legally protected and the Skylarks could be safe for future generations. So there'll be a long way to go. And it's very exciting news. There's a long way to go, but it's all about having these constructive discussions with the various different stakeholders involved. And I'm very, very optimistic about the site's future. I'm tempted to ask, how do you find the time for all this? Because, I mean, you're, you're 18 now. Yeah. So you, you, you've still got school, college, you know, boring stuff like that, which you have to attend. Well, I will ask, how do you find the time for all this? <laughs> well, I started when I was 13, so I've been doing this for five, nearly six years now. Um, been campaigning, wearing a number of different hats with the RSPB, London National Park City, and a few other conservation organisations, and, and now the RSA as well. Um, but I, I do it in my spare time. This is what I'm very passionate about, and I enjoy collaborating with people who are also passionate about the environment. Um, during my A levels, I hadn't I put that on hold um, because that was the main priority. But I'm in my gap year now. Uh, but I'm on my gap year between leaving school and going to study geography at university in September. So I found a lot more time to. Um, uh, work in, in my roles, my different conservation roles, uh, and learn a lot about that, whether it's practical conservation or, or policy making, and it's, and it's been fantastic. Interesting. I, I, I mentioned that you'd, you'd been on Spring Watch, and uh, a few months ago I interviewed Chris Packham. Uh, and Chris Packham is a, is a doughty campaigner, but when, no, he's away from the screen when I mean, he's not doing a sort of chirpy chappy stuff on screen. He can be quite quite thorough at accentuating the negative. He talks about having conservationists having failed. Um, and because I was doing this interview with him for Positive News, I just keep badgering him and saying, come on, Chris, give us something positive. Give us a sense of where, you, where do you find hope? And, and he said very gratifyingly, he said, well, I find hope in young people, in young people's passion and their, in, in their activism. And I, I absolutely know that you were one of those young people he had in mind when he said that. So if I sort of turn that question around to you, where, where do you find hope? Well, I find hope in passionate people working together. I think that's what conservation is all about. I think that's what the RSA is all about. I've come here, I came here and I've been a fellow since 
June last year. Uh, and it's been really wonderful. I've met fellows of all sorts of different, um, with all sorts of different professional backgrounds. And in the conservation roles I'm working in, um, whether it's um, practical conservation or policy or campaigning, I find it really uplifting to see so many people from so many different backgrounds coming together to make change. And it can happen, as shown by the Warren Farm. It was years of many different campaigners working together uh, on social media, lobbying the council, working with councillors. And change can happen even on a local level. And that makes you feel empowered to do even more. So that makes me feel positive, that there are passionate people who can work together and it achieves very positive results. Yeah, yeah. Um, turn to Lorraine. I mean, does your research, does it, does it bear some of that out? Do you find that that's, that's something which runs through, runs through things? Yeah, I think, I think it's interesting. A couple of things that I'll pick up on that, that can be mentioned is um, that the successes that he was talking about was about people coming together, actually, people that are passionate and committed, but also trying to find some commonality to sort of break through maybe deadlock. I think that really speaks to a lot of the things that we found in our work, which is that... Um, some of the sort of green lash that you mentioned mm. earlier, uh, and, and that shouldn't be overstated, I think, because mm. we do know that the vast majority of people are very concerned about climate change, but on certain policies and certain, certain interventions, there, have been, there has been some backlash. Often that is, at least in part, to do with people not feeling that they've been included in decision-making, mm. that the, the change is being imposed on them in a way that doesn't appreciate the, their circumstances. Um, so I think there's a lot to be said about kind of engaging people, and that's really where our work is focused. How can we how can work with the public? How can we bring the public with us, whoever that is, the sort of people that are really sort of you know active in this space, to 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 play a role in the transition to to net zero and to tackling climate change? Because that has been something which environmentalists have really struggled with. How, how, how do you get this out of the bubble? How do you persuade people this is something that is of relevance to their lives and that, yeah. as you say, they have some agency over? I mean, what are the conclusions you've drawn in that regard? Yeah, I, I think that's right. And I think, yeah, speaking to this point of hope, we, we do see that the majority of people are worried about climate change. A small minority say that they have kind of eco-anxiety, climate anxiety. That's slightly higher amongst young people probably because they feel they have less agency and power to do something about climate change, I think, as well as the, you know, the worst of the impacts being further into the future as well. Mm. Um, but it, 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 this, kind of, this idea of sort of empowerment is absolutely crucial because I think a lot of the time we're sort of you know, led to believe that the public, if they have a role to play at all in tackling climate change, it might be as a consumer. So maybe you can buy a, an electric vehicle or, or a heat pump. If you, if you can afford it, and there are huge cost barriers for a lot of people. But actually, there are many, many more things that people can do beyond their role as consumers. People are citizens, they can vote and protest, they can do things as part of uh, communities, they can do things in the workplace as professionals, um, and they can just, they can be a role model for people around them. So mm -hmm. for friends, family, neighbors, there's some great um, research that shows that, um, you're significantly more likely to buy a solar panel or an electric car if your neighbours have, have got one. Um, so you just look around you and you sort of see what other people are doing and that sort of, that starts to shift social norms actually. So, so there's lots of things that I think people can do and it is I think about reminding people that those roles are varied, that we can do a lot even if sometimes it seems like we can't. Yeah, yeah. I'm just going to try um, just to move on to the next point, a little vox pop here, which will be an, an opportunity for you to stretch your hands and put them up. Um, just hands up if you feel uh, we can definitely tackle the climate crisis. We have it in our power to tackle the climate crisis. So we've got a, a healthy majority, I'd say about three quarters. Um, as you know, this is also being live streamed, so if, in case this wasn't being um, broadcast, the hands up, about three quarters think we can. Um, hands up if you think we are doing so. We've got half a hand. No, we've got about three, four, four hands out of, I don't know how many people there are here, maybe 120 or so, a wild guess. So that's... Um, Slight, slight gap between um, possibility and reality. Finally, just out of interest, and I think the RSA is a, a particular sort of audience, it would be interesting to see how people respond to this one. 
Who has some sympathy with the green lash in the sense of uh, maybe we talk too much about win-wins, this is actually going to be quite tough, that we, there is a bit of skepticism around net zero, et cetera, et cetera. Who has some sympathy with that? OK, we've got, I would say, a healthy minority, maybe 15 people or so. Um, does that sort of vaguely match what you found in your research, Lorraine? Um, I would say what we've basically found is that the majority of the public support many of the sorts of net zero policies uh, that would involve behavior change. So we've asked the public about whether they would support some things like frequent flyer levies, which are where you would pay more per flight that you take each year. Um, uh, environmental pricing, so that you would pay more for things that, that, that pollute and you pay less potentially for things that are uh, less polluting. Um, uh, phasing out gas boilers, electric vehicle subsidies, lots and lots of different policies of different kinds um, that would imply people changing their behaviour and we find support, broad support, not, not universal, but majority support for, the, for, for those policies. Um, and yet we also have seen some obviously high profile examples like the ULES um, charge mm -hmm. uh, and, and 15 minute cities and low traffic neighbourhoods Certain, at certain local levels, there has been significant protest. But even in those areas, if you poll the, you get a representative sample of the public, generally there is more support than opposition to those, those policies. So it is important, I think, to sort of look at who is protesting, and they may be a very vocal minority often. And there's other research showing that if you ask the public, you know, how, what proportion of the public do you think is concerned about climate change? They will tend to vastly underestimate the numbers. So it's about 80-something mm. percent, mm. and people mm. think it's about half that. So people don't actually know that their worries about climate change and their support for climate policies are widely shared. It's it, because of the sort of the, the very vocal minorities that protest. That certainly bears up my own experience. I live in the People's Republic of Hackney, and there was huge, noisy opposition, or I should say noisy, not necessarily huge, noisy opposition to a series of low-traffic neighbourhoods. Um, and various candidates stood at the last local elections on anti-low traffic neighbourhood platforms. And in fact, the council was returned with, a, with an increased majority. So it seemed like the, you know, the silent majority was there, was there for, for action. Um, turning to Kabir, I mean, in terms of your peer group, your mates, it, do you feel any sense of scepticism, get people getting a bit weary? about everyone banging on about climate change or just the opposite? What's the feeling? I don't think my generation are as weary as they are anxious mm. because a lot of young people feel that they don't have the opportunities to act or they don't know how they can act, whether it's a, a lifestyle change or whether they can um, improve biodiversity in their local area. I don't think there is enough education at the moment. It is improving. And there are more young people um, who are receiving these opportunities, and that's brilliant. But I think, in, I think for the moment, th there is still a lot of anxiety. Um, I, think, I think often there is this, um, in the media, there's often this idea of environmentalists being demonized. And they are regarded as, uh, this is not, a, this is not a, a priority. This is something that only this minority of people feel and we should get on, if it's government, they might say well, we should get on with delivering what the British people really care about. But they don't really think of the environment in mind. So I think earlier you were talking about green lash and also environments not being on the agenda. And of course, there are so many issues in the news that matter to people and rightly so. But I often feel that the environment is, um, is overshadowed or is almost forgotten about. And if the environment is forgotten about in the media, then young people will, when they read the news, they won't see anything about the environment. Or even if it is in the media, often it's not in a, a positive light. So we need more positive news stories about the environment that people would feel empowered by. And they also need to be educated about it. Um, they need to be told about the opportunities uh, that, that they could have in, in their local area to make change. It is improving. There is going to be a natural history GCSE. Uh, Tim Smith, who was um, on before us, he has supported that. He's been involved with that in the past. Um, and um, I think it's, it's fantastic that we're at this stage where um, 
there will be a, a GCSE available to many students across the country. And that will be, I hope, revolutionary and empower young people to make a difference, whether it's practical, practical conservation or ecology, but at least they have that really good, strong foundation to say, I know what I can do. I can confidently make a difference. But I think it's all about changing the narrative, having more environmental news stories in the media that people can feel uh, uplifted by and people know that they can, uh, they can take action positive. And in terms of education generally, is it doing the right thing, did you find? Uh, the, the National History GCSE? Or no, no, education. much more generally, in terms of your, your experience of education yeah. and how that prepares young people for the climate crisis. Is it getting it right? It's getting better, but I'd say it was a little bit of a struggle for me to begin with. I set up a wildlife uh, society in school uh, when, I was, um, when I was much younger. Um, I, got, I got the support of my headmaster, who happened to be a very keen birder. Mm -hmm. And that was fantastic. And, and we managed to get uh, a lot of very curious uh, young people who were very curious about the environment. And they wanted to learn more. They're very open-minded. Mm -hmm. And then when the pandemic came, they all started to plant flowers and put up bird boxes, all the stuff that we discussed at Wildlife Society in our meetings and the small differences you can make. But I feel at the moment there's a very piecemeal approach. It's getting better, and, and when I say that, there are often more paid traineeships in um, sort of local wildlife trusts doing mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. There are volunteer groups going into schools from the local parks and local nature reserves and educating young people on, on the practical differences they can make. But there's no coordinated top-down direction yet, but I'm, I'm optimistic that that will change. There are financial problems in schools at the moment. We wanted to plant a hedge, and um, we were, I was going to write up a plan for that, and then they said, sorry, we can't do it, there's, there's no money. So, so there is a problem in the sense that we can't, we don't have enough, not every school will have enough money. Um, not every school will be able to afford new staff, to train new staff in this, uh, or get the, the right equipment. But I think there, there needs to be some sort of top-down direction to begin with. Yeah, yeah. Does that accord with what you're, you've found in your research? Yes, I was actually, I was, it's interesting you ask about climate education because um, colleagues of mine have just been evaluating the, the curriculum, the secondary school curriculum, uh, in terms of how and where climate change is taught across subjects. It's still very siloed, so it's in one or two places, like yeah. geography, for example. Yeah. Um, but very much the solutions are framed in quite technologically oriented ways still. So it's often about kind of changing the energy supply, so moving away from fossil fuels to renewables, which of course is a big part of the solution. But it, it very rarely really talks about the role that people can play in tackling climate change. So I, I think that, that part is really quite absent in the curriculum at the moment. Are there relatively easy wins, straightforward wins, that we're just missing? Uh, in terms of education or...? In term, or well, in terms, of, in terms of wider public engagement, including education, yeah. but also adults. I mean, there is no government strategy on public engagement around climate change. That, 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 that is a complete deficit that they've said that they will at some stage address and they have not yet. They just Why do you think that is? Are they scared of seeming wokish and nannyish? Or? I, yeah, I think there are, some of it is ideological. I think there is a sort mm. of a, a feeling that the government shouldn't be intervening in people's lifestyles, that that's too interventionist. Mm. So there is a concern there that that might be unpopular with the public, although our polling suggests that actually that's not true. Um, but there is also, I think, just a lack of understanding about the extent of social and behavioural change needed to tackle climate change. There is a bit of techno-optimism. Actually, it's quite explicit in some of the, some mm. of the government policies that you see that there, they are, there is just huge faith in technologies to save us, which we know from scientific assessments are not going to be sufficient by themselves. I guess that's partly the issue that technology that's just over the hill but probably coming down in 10 years' time it's an easy way of, of kicking decisions into the long grass, isn't it? Yeah. You can say, oh, we'll have net zero by 2035 or 2040 or whatever, because by then we'll have, you know, perovskite solar panels and it'll all be incredibly straightforward. I mean, is that part of the problem? I think that is part of the problem, and there is a desire, I think, to look for the, the, the economic wins as well. Mm -hmm. So it's about kind of, you know, thinking about what, how can we support sort of green jobs and, and business, and that's certainly very important. But then it's also, I think, about thinking more holistically about kind of the economy and thinking, well, maybe we don't, we, we need to be thinking more about kind of the circular economy. So it's maybe not about kind of, you know, making more things and, and sort of making those greener, but actually holding on to things for longer 
Um, and so actually having a more, you know, sort of repair economy, all of those sorts of things, mm. which doesn't necessarily challenge the fundamentals of sort of, mm. you know, economic growth if, it, if we don't want it to. But it is about kind of thinking about things in, 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 a, in a different way, I think, to how we have been. And it's much less shiny and sexy from a political point of view, yeah. isn't it? You know, yeah. It's not big numbers. There is, exactly. There is an assumption that if, we're, if people are consuming less, they're less happy. I think, you know, that this kind of people, you know, in order to sort of increase well-being, people have to consume more. Yeah. Actually, the evidence suggest, suggests that's, that's the, almost the opposite, actually. We've done work across a number of different countries showing that people that have the greenest lifestyles tend to, be, uh, tend to have higher well-being. So they will have a lower carbon footprint, but higher well-being. So it really challenges this assumption that it's about sacri going green is a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you engage with politicians at all? Well, I've, um, I've been a member of, I was a member of the London Rewilding Task Force. Um, I think that was, um, that was really, really eye-opening and insightful, learning from so many different people about um, wildlife in London and nature restoration and the governance of the environment in London. So the London Rewilding Task Force was a group of conservationists and ecologists and politicians from around London that came together, convened by the Mayor of London, to look into different ways in which we can restore London's wildlife and, um, and biodiversity on a very large scale. And I was involved in that um, in terms of uh, advising the environment team on how best to engage young people with the environment. Um, so I think, uh, Lorraine, you were talking about how um, the sort of policies often sort of geared up for uh, con uh, sort of consumption, and that's often seen separately from climate and the environment. Here I felt it was um, much more optimistic and gave me the optimism that there is the political will, it does exist, um, to restore nature and uh, the climate crisis, but in a way that involves everyone. And also in a way that says that we can, we can join up wildlife sites, we can get people, we can, we can improve people's access to nature, but that is not separate from growth and development and that sort of thing. You can, you can tie the two in together. It's not an either or situation. Um, so to view it in a much more holistic way is I think the best way forward. And I felt uh, that's what I took away from, from that experience that there were so many different people with so many different opinions. Uh, and um, at the end of the day, our report positively said that uh, London can be rewilded and people from the very beginning do have that responsibility to get involved with these projects and should, we should get them involved, um, but also in a way that's, um, that's in, very inclusive. Um, so it's, it's viewed as a, in the sense of climate justice being tied in with social justice, but it's yeah. a part of in, uh, improving quality of life, and they're not two separate things. So I think thinking of, of the environment and, environment and strategies around the environment much more holistically is, is a good way to do things. And politicians are fond of telling people what they want, um, including telling young people what they want. Have you actually had encounters with, with politicians locally? Locally, um, not... Or nationally? <laughs> <laughs> well, when I have spoken to politicians, the politicians that I have spoken to uh, across parties on a local level and on a national level, I think they are aware of the environmental concern that young people feel that um, you know, it's all very doom and gloom, that net zero targets are being ignored or being delayed, and um, the, not, not just the government, but both major parties have rode back on environmental policies, and I think that has increased that climate anxiety. I don't think, well, of course, as you mentioned earlier, not all politicians feel the same way about that. Um, you know, they might feel a bit skeptical, but uh, I was in uh, a round table uh, in Westminster in October to discuss the future of the Natural History GCSE and how we can best deliver that in schools. Um, and it got cross-party support. There was the chair of the, environment, the Education Select Committee, Robin Walker. He was very supportive of it. There was Vera Hobhouse, uh, the MP for Bath, uh, the Lib Dems, mm. and a number of other MPs in the room. And it showed that it's not, yes, it can be a political issue and it can be used uh, in, a, in a divisive way or in a political way. Um, but at the same time, there are politicians out there who, who do feel that collaboration is better and collaboration is the best way forward. Uh, and it's not a party, but it doesn't have to be a party political issue. You tempted to go into politics yourself? <laughs> um, well... <laughs> <laughs> You've got 100 votes already. <laughs> <laughs> not, not as a politician, no.
but, um, but I've been very interested, especially from my time on the task force, in policy and making change through policy. Yeah. And I feel that you know, it can take a very long time. There was a, a recent win from, from the RSPB recently where sand eel fishing was completely banned in parts of England and Scotland. Uh, and that was a real win, but that took 25 years, so it does take a very long time in some cases. Mm. But with the London Rewilding Task Force, it just took one year. So that was, that was fabulous. If there is the political will, and um, politicians are willing to see the environment and the climate crisis as a priority, then I would feel optimistic. Um, but I would want to, um, I still have a, a lot to learn about that, and I'm learning a lot yeah. about policy making and, and the, um, the um, sort of process of, of making policy and, and talking to politicians and working with uh, lots of different um, actors and stakeholders. But I feel that um, that is something that I'd be very, very interested in going into, especially after, after I finish yeah. university, into, into policy making and lobbying. Interesting. You heard it here first. Um, let's, let's take some questions. Um, we've got some roving mics, uh, so please wait for the mic. We've got quite a few of you want to ask a question, so if you can keep it fairly brief. And we're also going to have, I think, some questions popping up on this screen here from YouTube. So um, given that there are quite a few, I'm going to take a few at a time in geographical clusters. So somebody with a mic can start at the back of the room over there, please. And we'll take, say, three at a time, if we can remember three questions. Oh, God, we have to make notes. Hello, thank you very much. Um, I'm Sarah Anderson. I'm a GP from Brighton. Um, and I was thinking about what you said about uh, whether, I'm wondering whether people can be rewilded. Huh. Um, Absolutely, yes, people, and, people can be rewilded. <laughs> oh, sorry, you, I was, no, I think, I was sorry. thinking sorry, back to what Tim Smith about said about the imagination of childhood and whether we can uh, encourage that. And I've got two specific questions for the panel. Is to what extent do you see yourself as part of nature? And if you're part of nature, are you an individual or are you an ecosystem? Let's take that one straight away because I can't hope you'll remember five questions on the trot. Lorraine. Oh, good question. Um, I, I think Kabir's going to be a, a more qualified to answer this, but, but in terms of do I feel part of nature, I think often I, I don't. I live in the middle of a city. Uh, I don't have a garden, uh, and I, I think it's quite hard to, to find that nature connectedness, which at a, at a sort of theoretical level, I can sort of see humans are part of nature, but it's on a personal level, it can be very difficult to really experience that, I think. Yeah. Kabir. Well... Yeah, I, I also live in a very urban area. I do, I'm very lucky to have a garden, um, but I just need to do more with it. And I think, I think that's, that would make me feel more part of nature. And um, uh, I think I would need to you know, get outside more nowadays and go birding again. Um, I think, as a, as a, do I feel like I'm a part of nature? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. I think if I've immersed myself in nature, if I've found a, a local wildlife site, I'm lucky to have many wildlife sites on, on the edge of northwest London, uh, on the, sort of the Middlesex boundary, which is very biodiverse. There's a huge valley there, a Kong Valley, with loads of lakes and wetlands. If I'm walking through a place like that, I feel like I'm immersed in nature. I feel like I'm, I'm part of nature. Excellent. Um, and I feel like I'm part of that ecosystem. We'll take the other couple that were here. Thank you, Catherine Cameron. Hello, Martin. This is a question for the both panelists, and it picks up on what Martin's doing with positive news, really, about the role of reframing. So reframing action on climate, that we know it's a win-win for the planet, for future generations, and for us. So it's not courageous, it's common sense. Huh. So if we could reframe that, that changing your diet is not about giving up meat or dairy, it's about eating that will benefit you. Um, energy efficiency is not a hassle and a pain to do. It's going to save you money. So is there something about reframing? Volunteering is not giving up your time. It actually means that you have community, you yep. have courage, and you have better health and mental well-being. Yep. So could we talk more about reframing and less about courage? Thank you. So the win-win. Win-win-win. Completely agree. It's a, it's a really big part of the work that we do is how can we communicate climate change in ways that resonate more with people and the things that people value. Um, and so I think you're completely right. There is now the IPCC, for example, their latest assessment report actually showed 
uh, quite clearly that the vast majority of things that we can do to mitigate climate change have wider well-being and sustainability benefits. Uh, the health benefits being amongst the most well-evidenced. So actually most of the things that we can do to reduce emissions are good for our health. For example, walking, cycling, changing our diet, etc. Um, so I think absolutely communicating that is crucial. So that reframing. The other bit of the reframing I would say is, is around... I think there's tended to be uh, the, the media way of representing climate change has often been on sort of the impacts and maybe the bit of the doom and gloom. And we need to focus more on the solutions and the fact that actually there is a role for people to, to play and people are starting to, 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 to act. Um, so I think the solutions framing as well as the positive is crucial. Yeah. Hold any thoughts, Kabir. I'm just going to take a couple more questions. Uh, we've got somebody with a mic, have we? Hi, I'm doing my A-levels at the moment, and in terms of climate education, do you think that GCSEs is enough time? Because it's, it's two years of, a, of, of an education that takes 12 years, and there's a lot going on during those two years. So do you think we should start earlier, start in primary school, and keep going up to A-levels, have you know, a natural sciences, natural history, A-level, and other topics that link together? Because they're so divided, like biology, yeah. geography, A-level, they don't link up but can we have those links to make climate education better? Um, yes, I, I understand what you're saying about and how the GCSE is just one aspect. Um, I think um, there is already a lot of good work going on in primary schools, but the, the big um, uh, sort of gap is between primary school and secondary school where there isn't really anything at the moment. Once the GCSE comes in, um, it will bring in elements of biology, geography, geology, ecology, nature and I think that would be a very positive step but I, I agree that there would need to be something uh, in post-16 education that that would uh, further what has been established as a foundation at GCSE so I think we don't expect we shouldn't expect all young people to be passionate about the issue of climate change and nature because not everyone is going to be passionate but they'd have an interest they'd be curious about it and we'd encourage them to be open-minded so the more people who take the G, the more people take the G, we, we hope there'll be more people take the GCSE off um, at some point uh, when it's rolled out. But um, I'm hoping that there will be uh, some encouragement by the teachers or by the school to say that you've got this strong foundation. Um, seems that you're really interested in this. Why don't you go to post-16 post education, a, a practical course or, or something in A-levels? But I think it should be actively encouraged yeah. once the GCSE is in place. Let's try and take another little cluster of questions. Um, my word, we've got a lot. Let's do the central, central belt here, uh, if you could pass the mic. If you could keep your questions brief so that everyone gets a chance, that'd be grand. I'd be guilty to being a politician. Um, the question I want to ask is about culture wars, which seem to be worse and worse and the social bubbles and we're all here in one bubble and we can talk to one another and we all think how wonderful we are but there are other bubbles who are just we just don't touch and they're not hearing this yeah. and what does the panel think we can do to try and bridge social bubbles lovely thank you and then a person next to you i think had their hand up let's just uh, yeah. over there yep go ahead please no mike um and the theme of positive news uh, this past month, um, February 12th, we have biodiversity credits in policy now, um, which is a positive. And so my question is, I'm hearing you talk about uh, the challenge of valuing nature. It seems an underlying tone. Um, so now that if we actually have a policy constraint, a market constraint, that actually puts a pound and pence value on something of a unit that we call biodiversity, do we actually now begin to see levers where, in a market economy, we actually see people's behavior aligning to greater biodiversity and seeing uh, alignment instead of destruction for concrete over yeah. Uh, yeah. Interesting. Trees. Thank you. Um, so just take those two. Breaking out of the work bubble yep. and biodiversity. I don't know if you want to say anything about biodiversity net gain in response to that as well. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's probably more, I think Kabir can probably speak more authoritatively about, about that side of things. Although I guess what I would say is we absolutely need to kind of shift the incentives and disincentives. Um, my work's more on kind of climate than 
by diversity, but, but we see the same sorts of issues that at the moment people say there are cost barriers, there are, you know, it's very difficult to do the right thing, and yet people do want to. So I think as, and one of the most popular policies that, that we found was changing pricing to reflect environmental impacts such that you pay more for more polluting things and less for less polluting things. So actually, it does retain some choice for people, but actually, you know, they're rewarded if they make a good choice, essentially. So I think that is likely to be part of the solution. Um, on the culture wars, yeah, I completely agree. And of course, with sort of, you know, social media and so on, they're, they're, it, it can kind of reinforce a lot of these divisions. Um, uh, some of the work that we've done have, has um, looked at deliberative democracy and climate assemblies and cli um, citizens' panels and, and so on yeah. as ways of bringing together very diverse and ideally representative group, you know, groups of people. I was involved in Climate Assembly UK, so that was the only UK-wide uh, citizens' assembly on climate, which brought together over 100 members of the public, completely representative of the wider population demographically, but also in terms of climate attitudes. So you had everybody from you know, extremely concerned through to completely dismissive and skeptical. Um, in the room together, it was a, a little microcosm of the country. And there was an opportunity there over several weekends for these people to discuss and debate and talk to experts and people in the field about the solutions to climate change and to come up with their recommendations, their own d views about kind of how the UK should get to uh, net zero. And they came up with some very ambitious policy proposals, actually, that go beyond what the government is doing. But this is from a group of people that are extremely diverse. But when you get them in the room together, you can look at the evidence and you can weigh up the pros and cons and you can look at these wider benefits, these co-benefits, and actually say, well, even though I'm not particularly concerned about climate change, I can see that in terms of energy security, in terms of biodiversity, in terms of fuel bills, these, some of these solutions just make sense on that basis. So actually, it was fantastic to get together such a diverse group of people and we see some of this happening at local level where communities are coming together around say air pollution concerns or road safety concerns and actually there might be fantastic climate benefits to some of the stuff they're doing so but they don't have to be bought into climate concern it's actually they're doing it because of some other sets of more proximal worries so I think it, it is about sort of understanding where people are coming from and seeing what they have in common, even if maybe on climate or some other issues, they might be somewhat polarised. Yeah. Could be any thoughts to that, and including biodiversity net gain, if, if that's something that's, that's come across your radar. Something very new to, yeah. yeah. Um, so biodiversity net gain, I'm glad it's, you know, it's finally been implemented, it's finally mandatory. Um, I think, Lorraine, in regard to behaviour changes, I think you'd be more able to, to talk about that than, than, than I would. But, um, Do you want to just explain what biodiversity yeah. net gain is in case people don't? So I, th I think, uh, and someone in the audience correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's um, where the government has placed a, uh, uh, a mandatory 10% uh, net gain in biodiversity on, on developers. So what they will need to do is, when they're building a new development, they will need to restore biodiversity, protect biodiversity, but once they finish the development, it must have 10% more biodiversity than it already had before the development took place. Although not necessarily in the development site but itself. Not necessarily on the development, it can be off site. Yeah. Um, but um, will that lead to behavioral changes? Well, I hope so. No, no system is perfect. Biodiversity net gain is not perfect, but it's a, a very good step in the right direction. And I hope that will encourage um, and hopefully embed sort of more environmentally minded thinking um, in developers' minds in, in the way that uh, local councils work, perhaps, um, when they are delivering these new, sort of new developments. And, and I think, uh, going back to what I said earlier, too often I think the narrative is it's either or. It's either development or growth or the natural environment. It's either the built environment or the natural environment when you can link them together and they can work together and hopefully in due course we could be seeing that with biodiversity net gain. I think with regard to culture wars, um, yes, there is a lot of division. Envi the environment is often used as that topic in a, in a political way. You can see it, you know, Lorraine, you said on social media, you can see it a lot in the media. Um, but uh, as I said earlier, I think it's all about promoting the positive news stories that have been taking place. There are success stories that are, are taking place. And yes, we, we, do have, um, we do have a long way to go. Our net zero targets have been delayed, and, and that's a real disappointment. But uh, especially on a local level, I think um, uh, one of the um, people who asked questions, I think uh, you said that you were from 
Brighton. In Brighton, they've mandated swift boxes. They were the first council in the UK to mandate swift bricks, sorry. Um, so now every development has a um, responsibility to put up swift bricks. And swifts are very rare birds. Uh, they've been in decline for a very long time, and they migrate all the way from southern Africa and central Africa to the UK. And often, they are completely dependent on buildings. But Brighton & Hove has led the way in the, with that, and they have mandated bricks in, in all new houses and commercial developments. So if we can highlight and, um, and shed light on, shine a light on those positive news stories, and hopefully that will empower people. Yes, we've got a long way to go, but there are very good things that are still happening. Lovely. I'm going to cheekily go about two minutes over time because we did start a wee bit late. I'm afraid I'm just going to take two more questions from the people who've already got their mics in their paws. So the lady behind, first of all. First of all, thank you so much. What an inspiring session this has been. Um, I'm a children's author and educational campaigner. Um, and we can see the power of imagination and capturing children's imaginations so early. And the evidence is right in front of us about the, the generational scalability of children's imaginations. It's wonderful to hear that there's more going to be doing a more robust approach in schools. But um, obviously, there is so much pressure put on schools to do more and more. I feel sorry for teachers in the classroom. So is there, uh, do you, can, can you give us any examples of where business and community are coming together to support education in a way that supports a culture of change Lovely. in our young people? Thank you. And one question here. Hi. Um, I wanted to talk about public engagement. Uh, I just want to say we are starting a swift box project in South London, so uh, thanks for your tips on news. that. Uh, with regard to the public engagement, I, I, I do feel there is a certain level of scepticism about the government and other parties' commitment to uh, net zero and climate change. Um, I'm not going to go through the individual changes that have been made, but unless... Uh, there is a serious commitment from government and uh, the next government. Um, I fear that uh, a lot of people will just shrug their shoulders and say, you know, it's someone else's responsibility. Mm. So I feel there needs to be leadership, there needs to be a strong delivery plan. And also, as part of that, I think you've got to make it really easy for people to make these changes. There has to be some subsidies and money. You've got to make it easy because most of the assets, the houses, etc., are in the hands of older tranches yeah. of the population. Yeah. Thank you very much. So we've got the role of business and community in education, and then we've got the role of politicians and public yep. engagement. If you'd like to answer either or both of those quite briefly, and then finally, I've given you both a magic wand. You can wave it, and one thing that you wave your wand over will definitely happen. What is that one thing going to be? Yep. Um, we started with uh, Kabir, so I'm going to start with Lorraine to finish off, and then Kabir. I'll t try and take both of the questions together, because I was involved in the House of Lords inquiry on behaviour change for climate and environmental goals uh, about a, a, just over a year ago, and it came up with a fantastic report that said government is absolutely not doing enough. The public is on board in terms of wanting leadership. They don't see that leadership at the moment. Um, and, but they, and they want to play their part, but they find that it's very difficult. So government absolutely needs to be provide, make, making it easy for people to do the right thing. They need to put in place regulations, incentives, and so on to enable people to, to change their behavior. So that was very consistent, um, a, a very clear message that came out of that report. And in the same report, there were some examples of where businesses had been quite positive in engaging with customers and their employees as well around sort of taking action on climate change. Um, Marks and Spencer's talked about some of the, 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 their initiatives to encourage people to um, reuse clothes, I think hold on to clothes for longer. And um, I can't remember all the other examples, but there were, some nice, yeah. there were some nice examples of where some businesses are really taking quite a lead in this area. So, um, and on the wand, shall I answer Magic that? wand, please wave your wand. I would say, I mean, there's so many things I could have said, but my probably the lowest hanging fruit, where because though it's just win, 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 um, would be to tackle to, to insulate homes in order to reduce energy demand, address <laughs> address energy security, reduce. Um, energy bills, we're in a cost of living crisis to address indoor air quality. There are so many benefits to doing this, and yet policy is in completely wrong, the wrong direction in, in this space. So that would be my top thing. I think. Lovely. 
Thanks, Lorraine. You could be, you're the only person standing between these people and their lunch. <laughs> so if I could invite you to keep it fairly brief. I will be as brief as possible. Um, I was involved in a, um, in a consultation four years ago um, with regard to business and community working together and public engagement. Um, it was run by the Grosvenor Estate during the pandemic and was how to make uh, the new Grosvenor Square much, more, uh, much greener with community involvement. Um, there are a number of different people involved. Some people wanted there to be a more naturalistic effect, so plant more ornamental plants and make it aesthetically pleasing for the visitors and for the residents. And some, like myself, wanted that. Yes, there needs to be a balance of everything, but we wanted um, something more wild, something a little bit more... Um, some, uh, build more habitats like hedgerows and woodlands and meadows and um, designate certain areas of the square uh, sort of set aside some land to make those habitats. Um, so I think that's ongoing, and that's been going on for quite a number of years. But they have had really emphasised, um, they really emphasised the, the need for business and local communities to collaborate. Um, and then with, I mean, what, was, what was the other question? What was it on? Uh, the, the role of leadership. The role of leadership among politicians. Public engagement. Um, yeah, so I'm, what I've been involved in has been very positive. Of course, it won't, all, it won't always be that way, and it hasn't always been that way in the, we look at the bigger picture. But I think that um, there, there does need to be better direction when it comes to uh, public engagement on the climate and nature crisis, uh, what government and policy needs to say about that, um, but also um, make sure that people are aware of wildlife around them. I think um, often we, we all live in our own little bubbles. We are all focused on getting from A to B, whether it's on the tube or going for a walk uh, or going to work, but we don't realise um, the fantastic wildlife that's on our doorstep and the, um, the, the extent of, of different habitats around us. I think that's something that government should shine a light on as well and, and policy should encourage that people should be aware of the incredible wildlife around them. Yes, wildlife is in decline, but there is still so much that we have left that is precious and that is worth saving and people need to notice, appreciate and protect that. And, if, and to that end, if I were to wave a magic wand, I would say we actually need to protect our protected wildlife sites because they've been neglected for too long. We have sites of special scientific interests that are not in favourable condition. We have different uh, competing land uses in our national parks. National parks don't really, aren't really the best place for wildlife and for ecosystems at the moment. That is changing in, on a small level, but I think there needs to be a better approach to that. And I think in policy that is developing, so I'm more optimistic about that. Um, but we need to join up and make our wildlife sites more resilient, protect what we already have restore wildlife on a large scale and reconnect people of all different backgrounds, ages and abilities to our protected wildlife sites so that everyone can enjoy nature around them. Thanks, Kabir. <laughs> just, before, just before we wrap up, I've been asked to draw your attention to a youth collective called Arts Train who are going to be performing in the vaults where you're having lunch at about now. Uh, so sorry you couldn't get to everyone who wanted to ask questions. Uh, that's a tribute to how interesting the panel have been. So thank you very much for turning out. Thanks to everyone watching online. And above all, thank you to our panel, Kabir Lorraine. <laughs> <laughs>